In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the urinary system. But before I get started, you already know what to do. Go ahead and subscribe if you haven't, and also hit that like button. So the first thing about the urinary system is what's the overall function? So the urinary system, what it does is it helps to filter our blood. And it filters our blood in order to excrete some of the waste and regulate some of the components that are found within the blood. So what are some of the things that we are getting rid of? What, what is it that we are removing? So the urinary system helps to excrete a variety of things. Some of them include ammonium as well as urea. And both of these are byproducts. They're byproducts of amino acid metabolism. So we also have something which is known as creatinine. So creatinine is a byproduct of muscle metabolism. And then another thing that we get rid of is drugs. So these metabolized drugs. So what are the things that we're helping to regulate? So what we're trying to regulate, so first off you have nutrients. So you have nutrients as well as ions, including we're helping to regulate our blood pH as well as blood volume or blood pressure. Okay, so now that we've discussed the function, let's discuss some of the different processes that occur in order for urine to form. So some of these processes include filtration. So let me, I'm gonna do this here in red actually. Let's do this in red. So you have filtration, you have tubular reabsorption, as well as tubular, I'm just going to write secretion, tubular secretion. So where filtration occurs, this occurs within what's known as the renal corpuscle. So the renal corpuscle, that's what includes this particular area. So what I have drawn here on the board, this is what represents a particular type of nephron, which is known as a cortical nephron, and then this is what's representing what's known as a juxtamedullary nephron. And some of the uh, different components here, so this here is what I mentioned is the renal corpuscle, so you have Bowman's capsule here on the outside, and then this is this part here on the inside is what's known as the glomerulus. So I've already done a lecture on all the anatomy of, of the kidney. So make sure to um, watch that first before you start uh, going over some of this stuff here for the, for the urinary system. Okay, so reabsorption. So we've, we've already talked about how filtration occurs here within the renal corpuscle where we're getting the formation of something which is known as filtrate that travels here within all of these different tubules here, and then we get the formation of urine here as it, that collects here at the collecting duct. But for reabsorption, what's occurring? So what it primarily occurs, it's at a particular region which is known as a proximal convoluted tubule. So that's this particular region over here. So reabsorption occurs in the, in the, proximary, the proximal convoluted tubule, and what we're doing is we're getting the nutrients, so we're getting them from the tubules into the blood or with, within those capillaries. So for secretion, it's just the opposite. We're getting the components that are found within the blood, so in those capillaries, and then we're getting, we're getting it into the tubules so it can be removed. Okay, so I've already mentioned the two types of nephrons, so you have a, so this here is what's representing the cortical nephron, so I'll do this here in red. So A is the cortical nephron, and then you also have B, which is over here. So this is the juxtamedullary nephron. 
And they have two different roles. So for the cortical nephrons, their primary uh, responsibility, what they primarily do is, the re is reabsorption. So reabsorption for the cortical nephrons. And reabsorption primarily occurs, I'll write this here again, within the proximal uh, convoluted tubule. So then for the juxtamedullary nephrons, what primarily occurs here, this is what's known as urine concentration. So we can either form dilute urine or we can form, form really concentrated urine based off of the circumstances. And what I want to write here is the types of capillaries that are surrounding the cortical and then the juxtamedullary nephrons. So for the cortical um, nephrons, the capillaries include, they're what's known as the peritubular capillaries. For the juxtamedullary nephrons, they're what's known as the capillary network is here. So this is the capillary network for juxtamedullary and this is for cortical. So this is what's known as the vasa recta. Okay, so now let's talk about the specific processes. So let's go into the details of filtration. So with filtration, we have to know what it is that we're looking at. So once again, this here is Bowman's capsule. This here is what's known as the afferent arterial. We form the glomerular capillary network here. And then what comes out, this is what's known as the efferent arterial. This is coming out this way to help form this, the peritubular uh, capillaries over here. Okay. So overall, what is, what's happening during filtration? So blood is flowing in this direction. So it's flowing here into the afferent arterial, gets in through here. And so we're filtering all the components of blood. So remember, we have red blood cells that are traveling through here. We also have the protein components within the blood. So for instance, like hemoglobin, you also have um, immunoglobin, so an antibodies. You also have all of these different electrolytes that are traveling through here. And so what the overall goal is, what we're trying to do is get the, this fluid here into within this part here of, which is known as the nephron. So once we get it here into the nephron, we're going to reabsorb those nutrients here at this capillary network. And then the stuff that's circulating here in the blood, so for instance, like those drugs and things that we're trying to eliminate, we're getting it back here into the kidney um, within the nephron here to get rid of it into the collecting duct and then remember this eventually leads to the urinary bladder. Okay, so now let's get into the details here. So in order for filt uh, filtration to occur, there's a, a couple of different layers that we have to be familiar with. And this part that's here on the outside, this is what's known. So obviously this is the Bowman's capsule, but we call this the parietal layer. So this is the parietal layer. And this parietal layer is composed of simple squamous uh, tissue here. So then the, we also have uh, something which is known as the visceral layer. So the visceral layer, that is what's surrounding this, the glomerulus here, because this is, the, this is one of the blood vessels here on the inside. So there's a couple of uh, specific features about it that we need to discuss. So these red dots here that I have shown, what these are known as, they're known as fenestrations. Fenestrations. So these fenestrations, they're these little pores here. And so we want to have these pores here to prevent the movement of larger molecules from getting out. For instance, like the proteins that I was talking about. So you have the fenestrations, and then this part that's here in green, this is what is known as the podocytes or the foot cells. So these podocytes here, they're also reinforcing it to prevent larger molecules from leaking out because we're trying to get all of the water and the electrolytes and everything out. Okay, so now what I have blown up here, so this is what's known as the filtration membrane. So it's going to include some of the components here within the visceral layer. So what, what are they? So first off here, what I have shown here, this is what's representing those fenestrations. So you have the fenestrations here. 
So that's what these pores here in between the, the capillary. Okay, so then what about this part here, part B? So part B, this is what's known as the basement. So the basement membrane. Let me space it out. The basement membrane. And this basement membrane, it's composed of something specific, which is known as heparin sulfate. So this heparin sulfate, this is a what's known as a glyco, um, not a glycoprotein, it's known as a um, polysaccharide. And this polysaccharide, meaning that there's all these, um, all these sugars linked together, these sugars that are linked together, they contain this uh, sulfate molecule here. And so if you notice, this sulfate molecule, it's negatively charged. So what's the significance of that? Why do we want something that's negatively charged? Well, one of the things that's circulating here within the blood, so let me write here. So we, what we're doing is we are repelling those proteins that we we're talking about. So for instance, immunoglobins or antibodies, they are negatively charged. So we are repelling them from getting into the filtrate. Obviously, the size, but having this negative charge prevents them from uh, coming in. Another example is what's known as albumin. So albumin is this protein carrier that circulates within the blood. So these are two examples of things that are negatively charged that we're preventing them from getting filtered uh, here into uh, what's known as Bowman's capsule. Okay, so the next thing, so we talked about repelling some of these proteins, but it's also going to attract things that are positively charged, right? So what that's attracting is some of those cations that we talked about. So for instance, the electrolytes that we have. So for instance, sodium, calcium, potassium, all these positively charged things, it's easier for it to get through. Why? Because they're positively charged and then this is negatively charged. So they're coming together. They're attracted to each other. Okay. So the next thing, let's talk about C. Once again, so this is the, the foot processes. So the foot processes of those protocytes. So this, remember once again, we've already talked about this. This is a reinforcing uh, layer. So then uh, part D, what's here, this purple, this purple protein here that's in between these protocytes. So this is found, they're known as these, there's these slits here. And within these slits, we have something which is known as the filtration, the filtration slit. And this uh, filtration slit, it's composed of a specific protein which is known as nephrine. So you have nephrine here, that's what's in between each of these different um, podocytes. Okay, so then uh, one of the last things I want to talk about here is what's shown up here. And then it's also shown over here in green. But what these guys are known as, they're known as, let me do this in blue. They are known as mesangial cells. Mesangial cells. And these mesangial cells, they are phagocytes. So they are phagocytes that help to engulf or break things down. So for instance, if a protein gets through and gets caught up within that nephrine, these mesangial cells, they'll migrate and then they'll start to uh, break that protein down. Okay, so we've talked about how filtration occurs, how all of these components that are within the blood, they're getting filtered. So then now let's talk about the filtration pressure. So the net filtration pressure is when we consider the outward minus the inward pressures. And what I mean by that is there are pressures that are pushing the fluid out of the glomerulus and into the capsular space here within Bowman's capsule. And then there's also pressure in which the fluid that's within here 
is pushing fluid, is wanting to push the fluid back into the uh, glomerulus. So what do we term some of these different, these different pressures? So the first one is the hydrostatic pressure of the glomerular capillaries. So the hydrostatic pressure that's pushing the fluid out, the reason this happens is due to the difference in the arterial diameter. Because the afferent arterial, the diameter is bigger compared to the efferent arterial. And as a result, this enables the, the difference in the diameter results in an increase in pressure in order to push the fluid out and get it here into the capsular space. And so the typical, the value for this is 55 millimeters mercury. So then what about the inward pressures in which fluid is being pushed against the uh, glomerulus? So we have something which is known as the hydrostatic pressure within the capsular space. And this is due to the confined area here. So the confined area, that's, so this is a, cons a confined space here. So this, is, so this is Bowman's capsule and this is Bowman's space. So because this fluid here is within this confined space, it's pushing against the arterioles right there. And so as a result, the, the pressure is 15 millimeters mercury. So then the next pressure to consider is what's known as the colloid osmotic pressure within the glomerular capillaries. And this is due to the proteins that are circulating here within, within the capillaries. So this is due to the proteins here. So these proteins, they're sucking that fluid, they're sucking the fluid back into the capillaries. And so this typical reading, the value is roughly 30 millimeters mercury. So when you calculate the total net filtration pressure, you get 10 millimeters mercury. Okay, so now that we've talked about filtration, the next thing we need to discuss is reabsorption. So I've already mentioned that reabsorption primarily occurs within the cortical nephron. And so how does this process occur? So reabsorption primarily occurs within the cortical nephron within the region which is known as the proximal convoluted tubule. So that's what I have shown over here. And then all of this, this, this is the paratubular capillaries that are surrounding this area. And what are some of the components that we are reabsorbing and getting it back here into the blood? So first off, you have nutrients. So some of these nutrients include our glucose, we're reabsorbing amino acids, and we're also reabsorbing some of those fatty acids. We're also reabsorbing ions. So some of the positively charged things that we're re reabsorbing, so calcium, magnesium, sodium, as well as potassium. <clears throat> some of those negatively charged things that we're reabsorbing back into the blood. So for instance, bicarbonate ion as well as chloride ion. Some of the other things that we are reabsorbing back into the blood include urea as well as water. Okay. So how do we transport these materials and get it through into the capillaries? So what you're looking at here, these are some of the, some of the cells here for within the proximal convoluted tubule. So that's what's over here. So if you think about it, I would have these guys. So they're drawn like this. So we're blowing it up here and looking at it. And then this is what's representing the capillaries. So for instance, in order for glucose and amino acids, in order for them to get transported and get through here into the blood, we use something which is known as a co-transporter. So we're already familiar with this. So we'll have our sodium ion here. And then let's do this in purple. So let's do this in purple. So we'll have our sodium ion here. 
and then we'll either have amino acids or we can also have glucose. We're using this co-transporter in order to get these substances here into the cell. Well, how does this occur? So a similar, a similar concept that we are familiar with, we have to create which is known, uh, something which is known as an electrochemical gradient. And so we do this by using the sodium-potassium ATPase pump. So what we do is we pump sodium against its concentration gradient. So we pump the sodium out and then we're getting potassium in. And so as a result, this allows the sodium to flow into the cell here. And then once it gets here into the cell, it can then diffuse and get into within the blood. And this route that I'm talking about here, this mechanism is known as a transcellular, meaning that it's going through the cell. It's using these uh, facilitated, it's using this facilitated diffusion in order to get it here into the cell. Well, this is actually the, so this is the uh, primary active, and then this would be the um, secondary active uh, transporter. And another thing to mention here is that once uh, potassium gets in, we can also pump this potassium back out in order to keep it negative here, um, keep a negative uh, membrane potential here on the inside. Okay, so the next thing we need to talk about is the flow of water. So water uses something which is known as aquaporins. So I'll put an A here. So this is, so for water, we have aquaporins. So water is going to flow down here and then get into the, into the blood. So then what about ions? How do ions get transported? So ions, they'll use a paracellular uh, mechanism. So that's what's going here in between each of these cells. So let's write, so ions, so this is paracellular. And then I can also write for the other two, so the co-transporters, we're utilizing a transcellular route going through the cell. So once again, what are some of the ions that we're transporting through the paracellular route? It's these guys over here. That's how they're getting through. So then the, the last one here, you also have the fatty acids or just the lipids. We'll just say lipids, a general term here. So these lipids, they uh, travel through just, so lipids, they're just going to use diffusion, right? Because they're lipid solu soluble, so it's easy for them to diffuse here and get um, into the cell, uh, here get within the cell. 